Welcome back, guys. We've got another episode here of the Gate Guys podcast. We are after our summer sabbatical here. We take it every year, but I'm learning now from people emailing us saying, hey, where'd you guys go? We need to let you guys know where we went. So in the future, when we're going to take a month or two off, we need to remind you guys, and we'll try to do that. So we apologize, but we're back with another screaming podcast. It's a good one. It's an important one. And we go down some rabbit holes here on arm swing and thoracic extension and scapular retraction and why if you want to have normal arm swing that's a little less cross your body you probably want to look at maybe some deficits in thoracic extension or uh, thoracic rotation because those things can uh, modify the position of the scapula and thus the glenohumeral uh, motions and natural motion motions in running Naturally, if you're really rounded in the back and your shoulders are very protracted, your arm swing is going to be more across the body, which is going to feed a a neurologic uh, shaping, if you will, of how the legs are going to work. And so if you want to have a crossover gait, thrust your arms across your body and you're probably going to step uh, across the midline or at least midline and have a nice narrow um, steppage gait which we know is more economical but fraught with some liabilities and risks and some functional pathology that over time if you fatigue uh, or lose some strength you may develop some problems so we go into that today in depth and uh, we've go into depth with a lot of things um, uh, Ivo goes into some neurologic stuff which is really important about uh, spinal cord nuclei and why that's important if you're going to be looking at gait and looking at some of the automated uh, components of gait that are maybe not more centrally mediated or more which are more spinal cord related or, or mediated uh, on a local level instead of moving all the way up into the CNS and depending on a huge um, central pattern generator, if you will. So I will talks about that. We talk about uh, dropped arches, or in other words, feet that pronate a little bit more than normal and maybe why they do that and looking at a, a case, in fact, of a rear foot heel lift and a patient with forefoot pain on one side because the clinician put a heel lift on one side why that was a mistake and why it was relating to the patient's new symptoms uh, mitigated one symptom but brought on something else and so that's the old principle we've talked about here many times before where if you put a stone in someone's shoe you're going to change the way they walk it doesn't mean it's a good idea but if you want to change someone's gait just modify the shoe uh, and it can be as ridiculous and as simple as putting a rock in a shoe or a small pebble client's going to avoid it and it may change their pain doesn't mean it's a smart thing to do so heel lifts on some in some respects when not used clinically in a, in a, a well-fashioned manner uh, can generate the, uh, other problems uh, and certainly mitigate others so we tend to do that uh, we've seen people do that we don't do that but we've seen people do that for maybe heel pain or plantar fasciitis you, know, you raise the heel up and all of a sudden you've changed the weight loading response and uh, the impact loading response and you change your patient's symptoms and naturally think you've done something good where all you've done is teach your client how to compensate around a biomechanical flaw instead of actually reducing it so we go into that one here and we go into um, uh, the importance of ankle dorsiflexion and hip extension and um, maybe your client hasn't actually injured themselves they've just lost their ability to compensate and Ivo then goes into some real important stuff near the end of the podcast on Uh, testing your client and how um, testing can cheat and lie to you and maybe uh, throw you off a little bit so there's some important components there that Ivo feels are very important and I discuss a case where um, a a client came in and had some negative testing but they were clearly uh, pathologic uh, early degenerative neurodegenerative gait disorder Uh, they had clonus they had a loss of joint position sense and they clearly had altered gait patterns and uh, from that, uh, the EMG testing that another neurologist had done was normal. Client found out about me, came to see me, and I certainly confirmed that there was something going on and that the testing um, might not have been exactly what they needed. And Ivo talks about why that might have been a, a bit of a, a, um, a red herring a miss, if you will, in that uh, some other testing should have been done on that case. So, so I'm going to motor through this last little part. We've got three podcasts done uh this one's obviously up the other two are going through edits we are going to be breaking down those podcasts into small chunks so there might be a discussion on hip extension and we will uh, put that up on social media because we all digest things in better and smaller chunks 
Also, this podcast is a little bit fragmented because I had, had to edit out a lot of coughing on both my part and Ivo's part. Uh, we had uh, we both had a little virus, and uh, so we figured you guys didn't need blasts of sound and coughing into your ears, so that has been taken out. So this takes time, and we appreciate you guys sharing our stuff because we think we're trying to make a difference, and we hope we are, but it takes time, and it takes time out of our busy days and away from friends and family and, and, and work. So if you want to make a donation, uh, probably by the time the end of the week comes up, we're going to have our Patreon account up. So if you want to make a donation because you feel like we're saving you time and making a positive uh, effect uh, and impact on your life and your clinical life and saving you guys some time, please feel free to go over there and make a donation. We would really appreciate it. That's enough for now. Let's head into the podcast. All right, folks, we're back for another podcast here. And um, let's see. You know, in my clinic, we do, I, don't, I, I would imagine you and I practice very similarly. It's been a few years since we've been in the same clinical realm or in the same room, if you will. But, um, you know, I, I, I do a lot of uh, gait evaluations, obviously, but a lot of them are just watching people walk and watching people run out in the parking lot. And um, I don't use a treadmill anymore, although I probably should have a few times this winter, but I usually just take them outside think it's a little bit more realistic but um, you know there is an advantage definitely to using a treadmill in the office um, d- do you still use a treadmill I think you do don't you yeah yeah do you ever have people go outside or is that just not you know work because you're on a second or third floor aren't you I'm on the third floor but yeah we'll do that too sometimes we run yeah, outside okay. and follow yeah. people around and stuff um, it really depends um, on like what's going on and what the weather's doing when it's snowing we generally uh, don't go outside. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you do have a little bit longer of that season that makes it a little more difficult. Well, the reason I ask is because one thing that I tend to cue more and more into, and, and this may be a topic that we have you know, discussed before, but it's worth probably going over again, um, or at least touching on it from maybe another perspective, is arm swing. And I find the further I, I go into my practice of watching people walk and looking for aberrancies, Arm swing is one of the first things I always cue into. I think it's just easier to see than some of the other mechanical events down low. But it's becoming quite obvious that whenever there is an aberrant arm swing, meaning one side is swinging maybe forward more than the other side, or one side is is maybe swinging a little bit more posteriorly on the other, or the arm is abducted, or the arm is coming across the body, I tend to... Um, I tend to immediately go down into the lower extremity on the opposite side and look for a clue that plays off of that. Now, this goes very nicely into the discussions we've been having over the last two, uh, I think, podcasts 135 and 136 on arm swing and head over foot and all of those things. And although I still haven't changed my mind on that, um, I think my mind has gone a little bit deeper into some of these things. And it was really cued by our last podcast or our last um, online CE presentation where we we looked at that bird's eye view of our client um, or of a, a stick drawing of a client um, and looking down on that person when we saw the arm forward for example right arm is forward in arm swing and obviously left foot is forward in leg swing that those two were coupled in similar motions external rotation and flexion and the uh, obviously the ones the limbs that are behind us are in extension and internal rotation actually and i think you got transition. it uh Did no no never mind um no no you had no, it right no nope, yeah. you got it right external yes. external rotation in flexion internal flexion. rotation and extension yeah Right. So somewhere in the midst of there, and then I did. A, I decided to do a, po- a, a a post over on our page and Facebook on uh, adduction, and you know this kind of goes back to that uh, some of the training that some people are doing where they're crossing the bo- arm across the body at, for arm swing to create some kind of a, pu- a pump type effect or a thrusting effect across the body. Yeah, it's and a great way to create a crossover gate. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, and if you think about it, if your scapula is set backwards, in order to pump your arm across your body, you're going to create some impingement at the glenohumeral joint. So the only way to get around that is to create either more internal, or excuse me, more scapular um, protraction, and thoracic rotation to get that arm across the body. So now you're coaching actually thoracic rotation perhaps more than is normal. And I guess that's where I'm going with this is that a lot of the times when I see an aberrant arm swing, I often will put the patient down in a quadruped position on their hands and knees 
and uh, have them do a thoracic rotation, reaching one hand up to the ceiling to see how their thoracic rotation is. And lo and behold, on the, on the arm that has a barren swing, quite frequently I see a impaired thoracic rotation ability. So because they can't create normal thoracic rotation, they're creating more shoulder or scapular protraction to get the arm to cross. And that's one way that they're trying to make up for a lack of arm swing, which then leads to an impaired leg swing. Do you have some thoughts on that? Because thoracic rotation is obviously somewhere between leg swing and arm swing. It's that thoracic canister between the upper and lower limb. What are your thoughts on that? And is that something that you assess? Yeah, we assess it. Um, I think it's super important. Um, you know, lumbar spine is not going to have a ton of range of motion. You only have five degrees from L1 to L5, with most of that occurring at L5-S1, depending upon facet orientation. So piggybacking on what you said, one thing that we always do, if people have a pretty moderate difference from side to side with arm swing, is we'll shoot a quick AP um, like thoracolumbar shot, and we look at the orientation of the facets. So generally speaking, the facet joints in the thoracic spine should be largely in the coronal plane, and then at um, T12 L1, and then at um, L1 through L5, they should be sagittal, and then at L5 S1, they should be coronal again. And sometimes with individuals that have over or under rotation on one side, what you do is you'll see aberrances in their facet joint orientation. In other words, um, the facet joint, you know, you have a tropism. You have um, a sagittal facet on one side and a coronal on the other. And what that'll do on the sagittal facet side is allow more rotation on that side. So if the right side was sagittal, left side was coronal, from rotating from left to right, I'd have an increased amount of rotation um, that's going to occur there. So that's one of the things that we look at quite frequently. And, and the other day we had this gal come in that had, you know, and this wasn't as much a thoracic rotation problem, although she did have some aberrances in her gait, but she had a, a facet tropism at L4 and L5 and they were on opposite sides. So she had a sagittal, you know, normally at L5 S1, we should have coronal facets and she was sagittal on one side, coronal on the other. And then the exact opposite one level above, which is the first time I've ever seen it in, you know, 20 something years of practice, but it was right at the area where she's having all the back pain. So we needed to have a little discussion about, um, thoracic and uh, lumbar canister mechanics and moving like a log and uh, hinging from the hips and things like that so that she doesn't continually aggravate it. But you know, for people like that, great sports like bowling, you know, which is wonderful for your lumbar spine, golf, uh, unilateral uh, rotational activities are certainly going to be something which is uh, which is limited. But um, yeah, we assess arm swing. I had a, a gal in that came to see me um, yesterday, a sprinter hurdler um, from you know another place in the state. And uh, same deal, lots and lots of uh, increased crossover and arms just w coming way, way across the body, creating just more rotation than was physically possible um, at that level, creating some degree of irritation. And she had other things that played into it, you know, with an anterior pelvic tilt and an increased lumbar curve. Now you're already predisposing that area to over rotation because of biomechanics. And then you superimpose um, that on top of that, and it just creates more problems. So yeah, uh, in a very long-winded and roundabout way, yes, we we do assess that. Yeah, the um, it's it's become more and more clear that on the referrals that I get from outside sources that they're not looking at posture as much as they should. And I mean, in order to get normal scapular function and thus normal arm swing because okay so let's take a step back you need to have normal thoracic movement and the big one that everybody tends to lose is thoracic extension and thoracic rotation in order to get have normal scapular motion you have to have normal thoracic motion in order to get normal glenohumeral motion you have to have normal scapular thoracic stability and mobility and so there's this you know um peel back of of, of problems and so if you see someone with maybe some aberrant arm swing or shoulder pain, you need to look at the scapular thoracic interval to see if it's mobile and if it's stable. And one of the ones that tends to be overlooked is enough thoracic extension, particularly in the sprinters that I see. Um, and then as of late, they tend to be a lot of high school and college kids who are spending most of their day sitting. They don't have a lot of thoracic extension. 
So they tend to be in more um, scapular protraction and elevation, which tends to, excuse me, which tends to pull that um, glenohumeral joint more into a, a position where arm swing across the body is more prevalent. And we see this in a lot of runners where they just tend to lose their posture, particularly the distance runners over time, and they tend to slump a little bit more, which causes the arm swing to cross the body a little bit. And instead of coaching um, less crossing arm swing, we should be coaching more postural scapular um, positioning and thoracic mobility and extension, and then trying to you know stabilize that in their gait. And those are the types of things that um, will help with reducing the the crossover gait in the lower limbs. So it's just um, becoming more and more prevalent that this arm swing thing is a real problem. And when coached inappropriately, because of lack of knowledge of normal mechanics, you tend to force a arm swing that you would like as opposed to um, well, the one that the patient should or the client or athlete should be using on their own. So we do a lot of thoracic um, mobilizations now, um, self-mobilizations, corrective exercises, if you will, in thoracic extension and rotation to try and restore at least the spinal component so that the scapular component improves so that the arm swing component improves. And most people are rather shocked at how limited they are in thoracic rotation and extension. So just a little cue for all you guys to look at these things and make sure that you're assessing that component when you see an arm swing that you don't like. So, you know, and the thoughts on that. Yeah. And, and just going along with that, when you have those people that have limited thoracic extension in a lot of those folks, we see that they have either a loss of ankle rocker, B loss of hip extension, you know, so their Z angles diminished on one end or the other or both. And sometimes, you know, and you see this all the time as well on the table, like one of those or both of those are fine. Like they've got plenty of ankle dorsiflexion. They got plenty of hip extension, but they don't use it. But um, more times than not, in those people with a thoracic restriction, we see a restriction in one or both of those. And what they're trying to do is just borrow from the thoracic spine to try to get the extension that they can't get. Um, and you mm-hmm. see this a lot on, uh, and we've done lots of posts on this, we'll have a picture of a runner from like the front of runner's world or something. And it's like, he looks like he's got great form. And you look at him, and it's like, he's got no hip extension. It's all occurring in the lumbar spine. Um, so anyway, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite clear when we've done many posts on this over time that um, the legs tend to run that motor program and reflect are reflected in um, how the arm swing will move. And the arm swing basically is used to shape uh, and maybe uh, mildly affect the leg swing, but the leg swing does tend to trump that. So if you're pumping your arms across your body, you're going to be, meaning crossing midline, you're going to be, as you said earlier, pushing a crossover gate and vice versa. If you're into a crossover gate where your step width is narrow and you're basically running on a very narrow line, you're going to be um, using the arms as ballasts to try and find um, balance there. So you're probably going to be abducting your arms, but then when you do swing them through, you're going to be crossing the midline. So if you're seeing that these things are harder and harder to correct, it's because some of the patterns your client is using to drive what you know, you went very well into on podcast 136, which was the whole balance system and the um, the maintenance of the upright posture uh, from the uh, from the perspective of the central nervous system. So, you know, again, I guess we find ourselves pounding sand on arm swing, but it's very important that you understand that it's not only a shaper of the lower limb, but it also is a driver of a barren mechanic. So it's pretty hard to cross your arms across your body if you're not in thoracic flexion and arm protraction or shoulder or scapular protraction it's real easy to cross when you're in those bad postures so if you find that it's very easy and very natural to be doing that you might want to look at your posture and see what the heck you're doing because correcting thoracic uh positioning and get yourself more into neutral thoracic position and scapular set position where you are more powerful you're going to find it's a little bit more difficult to cross the midline freely when you're swinging your arm so I'm sure this can make some people mad, but I just, that's what we find clinically. And that's what biomechanically seems to be the rule. So, you know what I always wonder, and I haven't really been able to find, uh, any data on it in humans anyway, but 
Um, you know, I got young kids, as you know, they really are into dinosaurs. So if you look at sauropods, those are the big four-legged plant eaters like uh, Brachiosaurus and stuff like that, just the enormous, uh, the enormous ones. These animals were so big that they actually had an accessory brain within their spinal cord to control their hind legs because they had a very small brain, you know, to uh, body size and cranial size um, up front. And this multiple brain system um, is what helps drive locomotion. You almost have to wonder, do we have a motor programming system that exists, you know, in the lumbar enlargement or something like that with the legs, you know, or the arms, even in the cervical enlargement that's driving that, you know, the perigbrachial nucleus or nuclei normally were, were considered, you know, up a little more north in the brainstem. But is there some secondary center you know, and I haven't found anything yet. doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that I haven't found it. But it always makes mm-hmm. me think about that because they're so intimately connected. I mean, just think about the whole cross-crawl response or the whole cross-extensor response, you know, that's going on. And, yeah, cross-extensor mm-hmm. responses are a cord-mediated phenomena. But, um, you know, that's the way we're wired. So yeah. is there something within that interneuronal pool? You know, because think about this. What, what is the definition of a nucleus? A nucleus is a group of cell bodies within the central nervous system. That's all it is. They're just unmyelinated cell bodies. So theoretically, within the, um, within the gray um, of the cord, and we look at the cord, you know, got the H in the middle. That's all gray matter. The white around it is all axons, you know, myelinated axons. That's why it's white matter. You got to wonder, <clears throat> are there areas in there that are acting like um, nuclei, you know, that are actually driving the bus? Very interesting. Um, yeah, we should continue to search for that stuff. I mean, we do know that there is a, um, a lumbar spinal cord reflex there, right? I mean, that, that, that's early on. We, that's been established, right? I'm sorry. What do you mean by it's, that? There's, like, a re- you- there's a ref- there's, isn't there a reflexive response in the lower limbs that doesn't, is not mediated by the central nervous system higher up the higher centers? Well, cross extensor responses don't have to pass. They're, okay. they're modulated by the, by the CNS, but they don't have to occur. You know what I'm saying? Like okay. a withdrawal response. Right, know, exactly. Right, and things like that. No, that's hardwired right in at the segmental level. Okay. So that's not similar to what you were discussing, or is that something well, different? Uh, what I'm discussing is more of an actual grouping of okay. nerve cell bodies that are actually driving that, kind of like in sauropods, you know, um, big... Right. Brachiosaurs and things like that. These big yeah. dinosaurs that needed something to run their hind legs because, I mean, gosh, mm-hmm. you look at some of these animals and they were, you know, 60, 80, 100 feet long. You can imagine trying to run information from your brain down, you know, 100 mm-hmm. feet to get to the back, you know, the back legs to drive you forward. Right. 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 Interesting. I wonder how they found that out. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not sure. I just remember it was, seeing it was, about... Um, mm-hmm. you know, reading about it and hearing about it. Cause like I said, my kids are into a lot of that stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I've been doing something recently in the clinic and it's been helping me find some new patterns of dysfunction on people. And what I'm doing is not let you comment on it. It's having people raise their toes up. We all know that when people raise their toes, the arch raises because of the windless mechanism. So they raise their toes. They find the foot tripod arches up toes are up and then i have them do a single leg squat on that leg and a lot of folks forcing them into that foot tripod position and asking them to dorsiflex across the ankle during a squat loaded position a lot of them find they can't squat as deeply on the dysfunctional foot one because of pain but two they seem to get an earlier lockout and they don't feel as certain to load the ankle mortis in dorsiflexion as far down into the squat as they can on the non-symptomatic or dysfunctional side. And a lot of them say it just feels like a strength thing or a lack of a trust thing. But when I ask them to do it, and then at that point where they get stuck to allow the toes to come down, obviously the arch drops a little bit, but then they feel like they can easily go into the squat with more certainty, although it's dysfunctional. And it's helping me find in those more subtle cases which ankle and foot complex has a functional limitation and needs some more care what are your thoughts on that because 
by dropping the toes back down out of extension into flexion. It means that the arch can collapse and the first metatarsal can move into dorsiflexion, meaning the arch is splaying out a little bit. And that right. makes sense in clients who have like first metatarsal pain or plantar fascial pain or tip posterior dysfunction. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? We do a lot of toes up work in the office, mostly so you can fire into that extensor pool. So not only are you biomechanically helping them to find their tripod and engaging the windlass, you know, and um, raising the arch, which effectively puts the foot into more of a supinatory posture, which makes it mm -hmm. somewhat more rigid. You know, sometimes that's what uh, people need, but you're also feeding tons of information into that motor neuronal pool that's going to fire all your extensors. And mm -hmm. if we can get into our extensors more from a neurological standpoint, we can dampen more of that flexor activity. Because remember, flexors will reciprocally inhibit extensors, but there's also a pathway within the brainstem as it's coming down where flexors are going to directly neurologically inhibit extensors, whereas extensors, um, it, it's a different, you know, it's a different system. You don't have the double whammy that's going to try to shut you down. Now, there's a reason for that because we have way more dexterity on our flexors and things like that. But I think what happens, you know, and kind of like this goes back to what you're talking about with thoracic rotation and rounding of the shoulders and um, anterior aspect, it's, it's all flexed postures. And we just, as a society, because we have chairs and we have hard planar surfaces that we walk on and we work on devices and we have our head bent forward and we work on cell phones and computers and stuff like that all the time, that is always um, feeding into that flexor pool. So it becomes a little warped neuronally as well as hemispherically. So in other words, we start to you know, just facilitate flexor pathways way more than extensor pathways. And if you look at simple problems like carpal tunnel, tarsal tunnel, um, uh, you know, um, cubital tunnel syndromes like that, a lot of times there's an enormous flexor extensor imbalance, and that's what creates the problem in the first part. You know, you're getting increased muscular compression of the neurological structures from the flexor muscles, but in addition to that, you're creating shear forces, you know, across, um, like, say, the knee, you know, or something uh, like that. You think about mm -hmm. the orientation of the gastroc as it comes across. Not only does it, um, you know, flex the lower extremity in open chain or in closed chain, help to bend the leg, but it also pulls that femur backwards, almost like an accessory posterior cruciate ligament, you know. Um, the way it's mm -hmm. going to act. Yeah. And that happens at all of our extremity articulations and stuff. We see this. And it's really not talked about a lot, at least that I've seen. But, um, you know, a lot of people do talk about overuse of flexor activity. So one of our big things mm -hmm. is we are always, always pushing extensor activity um, just as far as that. And, you know, extensor activity, you have a higher density of spindles, you know, more muscle mechanoreceptors, things like that. It just makes your cerebellum happy. And when your cerebellum's happy, you can learn better, you can move better, um, you know, all of those things. Yeah, this, this became quite evident that, you know, in this one client, and he was in his, his stance, and even when I had him barefoot just doing squats, he would grip his toes more. So that's always been a clue to me um, that, you know, that foot isn't as stable and they're trying to gain more stability in the foot through the flexors. But we know that that's not exactly a, a sound pattern because as you said we're so flexor dominant at, not only in in patterns but as a protective pattern and so what i have clients do is just have them do some squats whether it's a goblet squat or um, even deadlifts barefoot with their toes up trying to find that neutral arch position good foot tripod and they f quite often will f not feel that pattern of you know ankle mortis lockout until they're at the very bottom if they even feel it and um, you put them on the table and you assess and there doesn't seem to be any weakness of the toe extensors or tib anterior it doesn't show up and I'm beginning to think that that test is just not sensitive enough in a loaded position in order to find it on the exam table so that's what's cued me to go into uh, toes up arch up single leg squat positions on the right side and then the left side and lo and behold it just becomes way more obvious not only to me, but to the client, that they can't move into that squat because they don't trust that foot tripod with the toes and extension. And they get ankle rocker lockout from a functional standpoint, even though on the table they have good ankle range, but they don't trust the stability of the foot and of the ankle mortis joint 
to move further into the squat. Um, but then you go ahead and you ask them to bring their toes down. They can squat through it, but you know that that's a, a compromise pattern. They end up splaying the foot out a little bit, uh, moving, moving medially through the, um, through the foot arch complex and pronating the foot a little bit more than they should. And you'll see a little bit of rear foot valgus positioning or eversion. And a lot of times that's what's driving some of the pathology, whether it's at that foot complex or at the medial knee or they're having to drive more internal hip rotation or not having to, but they're consequently driving more internal hip rotation because that's where the foot and knee are telling that hip to go. So it's just a pattern that I'm seeing more in the office and it tends to be a little bit more of a sensitive test. And obviously, um, if you can't do that standing, how are you going to do it walking? And certainly, how are you going to leap onto that foot when you're running and find a competent tripod? So I'm using it as a manner to back them up to show them that the problem runs deeper and it's more subtle than they thought. So I don't know. Do you have any other tricks in the office that you use that are similar to that? Well, not necessarily tricks, but one of the things that I know you do this as well is, and we've written on this before. I know there's a post. I can see it in my mind. It's got a pint of Ben and Jerry's sitting in the post. And what happens as we accelerate movement? And, you know, when you're talking about like taking a foot that's not necessarily competent and now running on it or jumping on it or landing on it, the faster we move, the more interpolation that the cortex has to do. So it says, oh, all right, we've done this before. So if we've done this and this is what happened before, we can interpolate and say that if you're doing this, then this is approximately what should happen. And you have what we referred to, you know, in that particular post as cortical fudge factor. In other words, you're just, the cortex is guessing and interpolating what what's going to happen next. So getting back to your question, one of the things we do is we slow movement down, like excessively, like ridiculously slow. Because if you can master it at a very, very slow, slow speed, you're going to have to have much better motor control than you are at a higher speed. That's why if you look at like common ski technology and you put people now that don't ski well, you can put them on current gear and they can ski much better right out of the box because the technology is making up or fudging for what they don't have from a nervous system, you know, balance coordination standpoint. Um, whereas you can take somebody else who's very experienced and put them on equipment that's less than optimal and they can do just as well because they've got um, less cortical fudge factor or more a fine motor you know, skill in that particular task. So you know, like you, one of the things we'll do if we're watching somebody, you know, we had a guy in today um, and uh, we were trying to bring something out. So you just bring your hands up over the head and have them walk. You know, and then if they, uh, you know, a lot of times that'll bring out pathology. If that doesn't do it, have them close their eyes, you know, while they're walking. Or I'll have them do some other task because we know that when we start to perform multitasks, if there's a break in the system, they become less efficient at a much higher rate. And you're going to start to see gait changes. We posted on this like two weeks ago. Today is the 25th that we're recording this in May. But it was either last week or the week before talking about it was two weeks ago, actually, um, how gait and steppage changes when we give people a mental task just while they're walking or running or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll do that. We'll give them computational things to do. We'll have them walk backwards. We do Michael Jackson walks, you know, anything we can to try to bring out where the problem is and show them where that is. And then from there, move in baby steps or sometimes, you know, bigger steps than that to get them to correct that pattern, but slowly first, and then, you know, faster skill, endurance, strength. I mean, what we talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of uh, injuries that people come in with are because they've learned how to compensate well around a faulty pattern. And then that pattern basically runs out of gas and the tissue uh, sustains too many loads, too many repetitive cyclical loads that are aberrant to the tissues tolerance to the load. And they get a tendonitis, a ligamentous strain, uh, who knows, you know, we go down that list, but, and a lot of the times, you know, you have them stand in a spot and do a single leg hop forward. Or like I like to do 15 hops quickly down the hallway on one side, 15 down on the other. And it looks great, but then you break it down. Like you just said, into slow motions, or you break it down into the single leg squat with the toes up. And all of a sudden 
the client can now feel the aberrancy. And then we, I go on that dialogue of, well, you don't feel that because you've learned how to, to negotiate around that. You've learned how to, as you say, fudge factor that problem out of the equation in order to find the skill or task or athletic endeavor that you're doing, but at a cost, of course, and that's why you're in my office. And so you slow them down, make them aware of that, and then ask them to hop. And then as they come back, they realize, oh, when I hop, I do feel that that foot does splay a little bit. I do feel that arch drop a little bit. And so it becomes more obvious to them how quickly or how, how well they've learned to compensate around it, as most people do. Um, we are inherently asymmetrical human beings, but we also are very good at um, compensating around those asymmetries to try and get you know, a symmetrical task to work for us, particularly if you're running in a straight line as a distance runner or sprinter or something like that. So it's good to slow things down. I think we did a post called the three, three second walk or five second walk where we slow someone down. And, uh, you know, you just brought up putting the hands on top of the head that takes the arm swing ballast effect out. And now you're just running that lower bo- lower limb program um, and trying to figure out how you, how the gate works without finding a ballast on the top end to make up for any balance challenges. I love that one. And I don't know if you showed me that one or that's when we figured out, who knows, but that is a beautiful little thing. I'm also adding farmer's carries now. I'll put a 25 kettle, pound kettlebell in one hand and have them walk and then have them put it in the other hand. And it tends to help bring out some of the asymmetries because that one side of the body is 25 pounds heavier. Um, so, and a lot of people, I think we did a post on this about a month ago where people will on the one side find core stability um, through the hip and then the core and the other client will or on the other side of the dysfunctional side, they'll actually go into lateral spine flexion in order to hold the kettlebell instead of trying to use that core side to stabilize it. They'll just go into a lateral uh, thoracolumbar lean into the frontal plane. So the body will find a way around this. And you're going to see these things as you start looking for them more and more in your client's gait or in their running stride or in their running form. Don't correct the running form. Find the problem that's driving that problem, which has been a, a soapbox for us for a long time. Yeah, giving them something heavy to carry, too, will really bring out that gluteus medius contralateral quadratus lumborum problem that you see in a lot of people, you know, because they can't couple. Those two things have to occur together, um, Mm -hmm. you know, to create a little bit of a pelvic rock, but also keep pelvic leveling. So if you add a little bit more weight, you're just adding a little more challenge. Um, It's just like, you know, if you got a guy that's breaking down at mile 20 seeing him fresh out of the box first thing in the morning isn't doing him any good because he's not going to be almost broken. You know, you got to get him to the point to where they're almost, you know, fatiguing or whatever's going on, but try to recreate the condition or at least the timing to the best of your abilities. Um, and, you know, something like that can really bring can really bring out pathology relatively quicker because, you know, you're and, you know, 20 pounds or so is substantial. You know, as far as that, especially yeah. in a lean individual, um, it's going to make a, a pretty big difference. Yeah. And, and you brought up a good point that, you know, if you're fatiguing around mile, whatever, 12, and your symptoms are pretty classically coming on around at that point, it wouldn't be foolish to stop at mile eight or so and do a double that day. Later that night, do another seven or eight miles so that you're never expressing the system into that limitation that you haven't built into the system you know i always say look let's find out where your problem exists if it's an endurance based problem and cut it shy of that and build a base around something that's close to your problem but not into your problem and as we build that base in there and we're doing the rehab and the corrective work then we can basically move beyond that limit where you tend to break down and clients they like that because they un- they can understand that, you know, especially, you know, it's always on my long run that I have my problems. It's never on my five to seven or eight mile runs. It's always on that long Saturday or Sunday run. That's when I have problems. That's when I get my injuries. And so I said, look, well, we just have to figure out that, you know, obviously you're taxing the system to the point where it can't tolerate the loading response at that point. You're fatiguing through it or the tissue just doesn't have the resiliency or durability to sustain the amount of loads that you're putting through there. So let's just back it up and you know, do a double on that Saturday or, you know, run another long run with limitation to the extent on Sunday so that we can build up your endurance, but would still not hit that point where we're triggering symptoms. So sometimes training and coaching and and whatnot is just about being a little bit smarter than the problems that your client has. So 
<laughs> or just looking. And you, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or listening or, you know, just paying closer attention. You know, the devil is always in the details um, as far as that goes. And there's always, you know, especially the people that have been everywhere and then they come to you. You know, it's not like you're mu- that much better necessarily at, you know, whatever's going on. Maybe you're just listening more or you're paying more attention to different things that somebody else might not have done. You know, we see this a lot with chiropractors, you know, and not, Mm -hmm. it's a bad thing, but you know, oh, they've been everywhere, but you haven't been adjusted by me, you know, and you know, my adjustments are so much different. And yes, you know, there are differences in technique and stuff, but, um, a lot of times it's, you know, it, it, it's ne- not necessarily that it's something yeah. else that's been missed along the way. And, you know, sometimes it's something stupid, like it's their shoe, <laughs> you know, or, mm-hmm. um, they don't have, you know, as enough inversion, eversion on one side or, you know, just, I mean, I don't have to tell you it's silly stuff sometimes. And you're kind of like, really? Mm-hmm. Like nobody saw this, you know? And then you do something and everybody thinks it's magic and it's like you really didn't do anything. You're just kind of like, well, this was what we saw. So this is what we did. You know, you know it's so often like that. I had a lady on a referral from an outside doc uh, come in yesterday and she has orthotics, which first of all, she didn't need, in my opinion. And I felt pretty strongly about that. And I told her so and I showed her why. And, um, quite frequently in those clients, I'll have them stand with their toes up and their arch goes up. And I said, look, do you have a competent arch? No, but do you have an arch? You do. So don't tell me that your arch has fallen. Your foot has just gotten weaker and you've lost some skill, endurance, and strength in the skill of holding that arch up. So you can either wear the orthotic, which is a wedge, and you can jimmy rig this system and wear orthotics for the rest of your life. Or maybe we can give you some corrective work to raise that arch up and give you better skills. So she you know, there was a raised eyebrow, but the further I went on my exam, she started to realize that there was a lot more to this than just jacking up the foot with an orthotic. But she happened to have a quarter inch lift on the rear foot of that orthotic. So I went into the whole discussion of, well, they just plantar flexed your foot now, right? They just raised the rear foot, but not the forefoot. She happened to be coming in because she was having forefoot pain on that side. And I said, well, you're constantly loading the forefoot quicker, sooner, longer, and more abruptly than you should. So I actually went and got a piece of a three millimeter cork and I stuffed it in the front part of her shoe just underneath the metatarsal pads and I had her walk and she was shocked that her pain was gone immediately and I said well I just raised up the front of the foot to the level at least closer to what the rear foot is she's like well how did that affect my big toe pain and I said well and I went through the whole windless thing when your foot's plantar flexed when the first metatarsal's plantar flexed you can raise the toe more and just that whole thing you know the sesamoids were just increased compression and friction at the sesamoids and everything. So I told her, why don't we grind down the rear foot of that orthotic so there's no lift on it anymore so I don't have to put it in the forefoot? Well, she didn't want to ruin her orthotics because you could tell that she wasn't fully bought in. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, use the, use the insert right now. But, um, and once you feel comfortable with that, then we can grind at the rear foot and we'll buy some of that toe box room that's being eaten up by the cork that I threw in the front of her shoe. But what was even more prevalent and evident was that her leg was short because she didn't have any external rotation at the hip. It was maybe um, probably 30 degrees limited from comparison to the other side from the end range. It was significant enough. And obviously her glute was weak then. If you don't, if you don't have the strength, you don't have the range that that strength provided or allowed you to go into. So I said, Hey, let's, let's see what happens to your leg length discrepancy, which Looking at it on the table, yes, it's unreliable because the pelvic distortion pattern can throw it off and whatnot. But she was shocked to see how weak the glute was on that side. And so I did some muscle work there, some activation. We did some repetitive isometrics and then some eccentric concentric loads. And we gave it a good workout to the point where she felt it was starting to get tired. Later back down on the table, nice external rotation. And I showed her as best I could. It's kind of hard. She's at the other end of the table that leg length had restored itself. One of her major complaints was that she has to sit on an ischial lift in order to feel comfortable. I sat her on a hard chair and she felt like she was squared. And she said, how is someone else not looking at all of these pieces? And I said, well, it's all connected. And she didn't understand why. And I said, look, how long does your doctor spend with you? Well, you know, 10 minutes. And I said, 
this is already taking me 20, 25 minutes. So how do you expect them to find it when they're not spending the time, which goes right back to the heart of what you were just discussing. You've got to talk to your client. You've got to spend time with them. So long story short, you know, her treatment plan is hopefully to grind out the, the lift that she doesn't need, restore external rotation and glute function to hopefully restore better hip ranges, which might actually give her more neutral um, hip pelvis mechanics, which should at least help normalize a functional leg length discrepancy. And then teach her how to function the foot a little bit better so she doesn't have to collapse into an orthotic. She can actually have the functionality to find a neutral foot on that, which will then normalize the first metatarsal phalangeal joint where she was having some of her pain on the plantar side. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm always kind of shocked, as I think you are too, that this isn't rocket science. Why aren't other people doing this? And maybe some are, and maybe those are the ones that don't need to listen to our podcast, but I, I still think there's a rather, you know, hearty epidemic out there of people that just aren't spending time looking for these connected parts. So but nobody's, I don't know if you have any soapbox. No, yeah, no, but nobody's teaching that, man. I mean, that's what part yeah. of it is. I mean, why yeah. do you listen to podcasts? Because yeah. I'm not getting mm. what I want from the conventional sources that I usually get it from. So I'm listening yeah. because I want to know more about, you know, thyroid metabolism or, you know, some aspect of gait or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what it is, you know, and the people that do listen to us and follow us are the ones that want to know that and go the extra mile, you know, as far as that goes. Or there are consumer people that, and we're getting more and more people that are non-physicians, non-clinicians, non-trainers that are listening to us that have been doing mm -hmm. so for years and getting way more educated about what they do in their sport, whether that's running, you know, skiing, bicycling, you know, javelin throwing, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, they're just getting that and understanding that, gee, when we do study the human movement, we look at all these other factors, it makes so much more sense, you know? Yeah. Hey, so we just went through our, oh God, it almost seems like a yearly epidemic now of right hip pain in our high school and local college track runners. And, you know, one of the big problems is the tracks, the indoor tracks are, and this is during the indoor track season, are so small, you know, 140, 160 meters. These tracks are so small, you're basically just constantly doing a turn. And you had mentioned, so it's worthy of mentioning it in this podcast, that when you're standing on your right leg, you need to be able to use the right glute maybe more glute medius than anything else, um, to level out the pelvis. So when you lift that left foot off the ground, you have to be able to get enough glute medius on that right stance phase leg to keep the pelvis level. Yeah, you're going to use the abdominals on the other side and maybe some on the same side, ipsilateral side, to help stabilize, but you ha need to have enough glute strength and durability to do that. So now take that leg and put it on a track where you're always kind of on a leaning into the middle just a little bit, in order to make that turn a little bit more a uh, higher velocity based you're going to need that much more glute medius in order to control that outside driving force that's going to make that hip want to bump into the frontal plane and uh, we just went through our yearly epidemic of gluteal tendinopathies and ham upper hamstring strains in our track runners uh, right at the end of this indoor season there and uh, frustrating as always but um, that's why we try to limit our indoor races to two for most of our high-end runners and say, look, let's save you for the outdoor season when it matters because this indoor stuff is just fraught with injuries. So I don't know if you see much of that out there in Colorado, but we see a lot of it here in Chicago. Yeah, folks here, I mean, we've got track runners and stuff, obviously, that we see. I would say the majority of people here, besides younger folks that are in high school, are trail runners. Um, and that's what we see. So that's like, you know, a different animal um, right. a, as far as what that is. But, um, yeah, I mean, we see some, but I would say not nearly as many. You know, um, where I live and the colleges local here are not known for their track stars. You know, we do mm -hmm. produce Olympic snowboarders and skiers and, <laughs> and things like mm -hmm. that um, and world-class mountain biker and road biker people. But we're not known for producing track people. <laughs> Well, for those listening, um, indoor track, you know, it's, uh, look at that outside hip and hamstring and do more loading work <coughs> with your clients because they need more durability to get through that rough spot. So, 
So it's just something we see a lot of. And if you guys are seeing a lot of that indoor track stuff in your neighborhood and you're getting a lot of that high gluteal tendinopathy or hamstring tendinopathy, you need to be taking your clients and adding more um, isometric loads in those extreme positions to make that tissue more durable. Exactly. Well, have you seen any other uh, patterns in your clinic as of recent? Uh, some classic, you know, things come in threes, as we always say. And have you seen anything more consistently lately that's making your eyebrow raised up a little bit? Not necessarily. You know, the usual ankle dorsiflexion, hip extension connection that we see all the time, and to some degree, ability to extend the shoulder, you know, as well mm -hmm. um, on that side that's extending. So we see that all the time. What amazes me most is how many folks have the range of motion, but they just don't use it. You know, yeah, that, that's a big one. That's what amazes me. I, you know, this track gal that I had in yesterday, it was that deal. And, you know, she's like, oh, I'm going to physical therapy and they're doing this strengthening and this and that. And I'm like, well, you're not weak. You know, you're lazy, <laughs> but you're not yeah. weak. It's like, you know, and I showed her what the problem was and, you know, I could see the bells going off as far as that. And not that the, you know, the therapists weren't helping. It just wasn't fixing the problem. It was band-aiding the problem, you know, um, as far as that goes. So it's like, well, we kind of need to delve a little bit deeper and approach some of these other things. And if we can do yeah. that, then hopefully um, it'll be that much better. But that's, that's the thing that always amazes me. Like you think, oh, my gosh, you know, this person's going to have no ankle dorsiflexion you look at them and it's like they got 10 to 15 degrees you're like well that's more than enough you know <laughs> why are they yeah. not using yeah. it um and then that starts always when they're not using it that always makes me start looking north of you know the spine and uh, brain stuff you know do they have some kind of visual impairment is there a mild vestibular impairment that's preventing them from accessing you know that particular uh, group of muscles or or whichever you know and uh you got to Think about all these cortical lesions, we'll call them, but they're not boo-boos that you can see on an MRI. You know, they're physiological lesions that occur because, you know, you get a short somewhere in the system or something's not firing the way it's supposed to into the right neuronal pool, and that creates, you know, some of the things that we're seeing, and it's just a matter of getting in there and, um, you know, altering that pattern or changing it up. And that's why some mm -hmm. of these treatments that people do that are kind of wacky work. You know, you're just, you're throwing something so radical at it that the system needs to readapt and the body likes the readaptation. You mm -hmm. know, I'm, I'm forever telling people when they come in, it's like, oh, you didn't injure yourself. You just lost your ability to compensate. You know, this injury has been there for a long time. <laughs> it's just, you can't use that compensation pattern anymore and that's why you're here. So, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to help you compensate differently. <laughs> and yeah. How often do you see, how often is that the case, right? That's right. just crazy. How, and I, yeah. yeah. I'm just teaching them another way to compensate, you know, and yeah. I'm functioning better. And, oh, you fixed my pain. Well, no, I, I made it so you don't feel your pain. But that doesn't mean I fixed the problem. It just means that you don't yeah. feel your pain, you know, or I improve your performance or, you know, whichever that is. Um, but, yeah, that's... Well, that's, you know, that's a dialogue I have all the time, you know, like, well, why did this start now? I said, well, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, if we walk you back 5% on your problem, you're going to be pain-free but you're still 5% from trouble again, you know? So do you want to walk this back all the way and build good durability on a cleaner pattern? Or is 5% good enough? Because as soon as you're out of pain, it doesn't mean that you're out of trouble. You know, it's still on the horizon. You just move the finish line a little bit. And so, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And if you build a ton of durability around that 5% on the other side of the threshold of pain problem, you're still doing your, your client a huge service. But back them up as far as you can. Clean up the patterns as much as you can. Find how many different compensation patterns your client has had that got them there. That they're having foot pain because they're collapsing the foot tripod. Okay, give them better foot tripod work. They might be out of pain, but maybe they were collapsing too much because the leg was internally spinning because they didn't have enough glute eccentric loading strength to stop the rate and amount of internal hip rotation. And maybe that was occurring because they didn't have enough hip and pelvis stability during stance phase during the loading response and they were just throwing out all the internal rotation at once because they couldn't control it so how far do you want to walk back your client sometimes clients want to walk it back all the way and it's also why sometimes well my foot hurts but i've been having some hip stiffness and some low back stiffness for a couple months prior to this i don't think it's related but i just thought i would mention it like oh it's related probably let's have a look and so you draw out that whole picture for your client and said look 
Here, we can fix the foot, but we'll, let's walk this back as well. So here's some hip homework, and here's some hip stability work. Let's walk this thing back as far away from the start, from the finish line as we can, and get you into a cleaner pattern. So, you know, I think that's that's good treatment, but we, you know, a lot of people are tunnel visioned on, oh, well, let's just give an orthotic and stop you from pronating too much. Oh, my pain went away. I need orthotics. Well, I mean, if that's as far as we're going to look, yeah, you might need orthotics. But maybe we can do better by controlling the whole limb and the stability at the top of this funnel because you're just seeing what's coming out the bottom of the funnel. There's a whole lot of crap going in at the top end, and you're just stuffing it through. So, um, well, hey, with, one more thing. Unless you, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, but some people, that's what they want. They just want... Mm-hmm. You know, and we see oh, lots sure. of people with, for orthotics, and that's just what they wanted because it takes your brain yeah. out of the equation. It gives you sure, the mechanics absolutely. you don't have, and I don't have to do an exercise. I just need to change my prescription every, you know, whatever, 18 months, 36 months, whatever. And until they run out of ability to compensate on that road, they can ride that road for decades um, yeah. as far as that goes. I mean, you can do a ton with an orthotic device as far as changing everything that's going on mechanically north. I mean, Sean mm-hmm. Eno is, has taught me, you know, and Peter Morin and all those few people, Gerhard Rell, that I've studied with, I mean, have just taught me volumes about what you can do by just altering somebody's foot mechanics, you know, north yeah. of there. But some people, they have no interest in doing the exercises or whatever. They just, mm-hmm. they want the quick fix and then that's it. I'm in pain. I can go do what I want to do. And they do it. You know, and that's cool. I, I just, I tell people, it's like, all right, if, if that's what you want, that's totally good with me. You know, it actually makes my job yep. a lot easier, you know. Yeah, you're the customer, right. whatever you want. Right. Anyway, you you were going to say, because we're running out of time here. Yeah, well, I just have, well, in the last two months, roughly two months, I've seen three clients now. That, Only three in two months? Uh, yeah, that's What do you it. charge, like six, six million dollars a visit or what? <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a busy season, yeah. So... Three clients referred in from MDs, and these clients, um, they were told to tell, to see me because they had some gait problems. And these clients had been to neurologists, and they'd been mostly dismissed. These clients clearly had a movement disorder, of which I'm not real good at labeling these things. But this last guy that came in, and it's the, th- the third client in a row where I tell them, look, you need to go back to this neurologist, and I need an EMG NCV and maybe some advanced imaging at the lumbar spine level, cervical spine or brain or something. Because you clearly, I mean, this, these patients all had clonus, um, loss of joint position sense, um, uh, hyperreflexia on one side. Watching their gait, you thought there's no question there is a movement disorder here or an upper motor neuron disease that's slowly progressing. But it was clear, and I'm reminded of what Dr. Carrick said, that, you know, Often someone's subtle gait changes are the first clinical presentation of a, of a more, you know, a, a slowly progressing neurologic disorder. This guy goes out, gets the EMG NCV, lumbar and brain MRI, absolutely normal. And yet it's clear if you saw this person, most people, I mean, he was sent in by his wife who said he's walking weird. His wife could see it, who has no medical background at all. It was clear as day to me. I got him up off the table. I'm like, oh, boy, we got a problem here. Um, do the neurologic screen. Shows up neurologically that something is going on. But nothing shows up on the EMG. From someone who does a lot of EMG and CV testing and knows a lot about this neurologic stuff, what are your thoughts on that? And why is stuff not showing up? Well, do you have any answers for me? Because I'm a little bit, you know, head scratching on this. Well, a, a lot of times it's just it hasn't gotten to the point where it's <clears throat> the sensitivity of the equipment is able to pick it up. So we see physiological lesions all the time, and they're boo-boos that are electrical. They're not physical. So you're not going to see a blip you know, on the screen um, and things like that. The big thing, too, when you're ordering neurological testing, right, so you have most nerve conduction testing and things like that, most, not all, is all efferent pathology you're looking at. You're looking at end organ disease. You do an EMG, you're looking at the muscle. You're not looking at afferent from the muscle at all. You're looking at all efferent. You're doing a standard nerve conduction velocity test. You're looking at the efferent aspect of the nerve. Most pathology is afferent. It's the input that's the problem. How many people, when they do that, do sensory nerve action potentials? A lot of times they're not done. How many people do F-waves? 
most of the time it's not done. You know, hmm. why? Well, technically, they're more difficult to elicit. And when you're doing the interpretation, um, you have to have really good technique and your, um, your methods need to be super clean or you're going to get, you know, crap for results. But um, a lot of times it is there. It's just that people didn't look in the right spot. As right. far as that, you know, an F wave basically is like looking at a, um, a, a tendon reflex, except what happens is you reverse the polarity. So rather than shoot the electricity down the nerve, you shoot it up the nerve into the cord, and then the information comes back down, and you're recording that information that's coming back down again. So you're looking at the arc, not just from mm-hmm. point A to point B. Well, a lot okay. of times that's not done. Um, you can look at um, SSEPs, somatosensory evoked potentials. People don't do them a lot of times because, again, it takes a lot of technical proficiency to be able to do that. So mm-hmm. sometimes it's just it, it, it's not there because you're not looking. And, you know, when I did NCVs and EMGs, and we used to do a fair number of those, and we just stopped doing it because it just wasn't cost effective anymore. But a lot of times, mm-hmm. you know, the, the doc would say, oh, you know, we want you to do this. And you do that. And, of course, it's going to come back negative. It's because they weren't looking in the right spot. Right. And when you go and you just do that one extra test or that one extra level or that other muscle or whatever, all of a sudden now mm-hmm. it's like, oh, yeah, they do have a problem. And, you know, the reason they have this is because, you know, this nerve which you didn't even, you know, necessarily want tested, but we went ahead and tested anyway because that's what we found on exam, is having the issue, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, most of our modalities, unfortunately, are treating efferent, not afferent um, yeah. pathology and looking at that. And it's just like, you know, when we're, when we're doing treatments, surgery and stuff a lot of times is looking at the end result, not what do we need to do to change that input so we don't get that end result anymore. Yeah. I mean, how about that as a comment to... You know, well, it's not on my MRI, so they didn't find anything. And, you know, you order the MRI again, you order it in one millimeter slices, and you la- ask for a, you know, a short term aversion recovery, a stir imaging. Uh, you ask for some more specifics, and you tell the, the doc, I need one millimeter cuts to the medial compartment of the knee. And lo and behold, you find it. Well, yeah. just because. The, the, the modality was it wasn't set to be sensitive enough or a lot of the times these radiologists and and you know in this case the EMG doc they were just ordering they were doing the test that was ordered because that's what was given to them as the test that was required you know they assume that the clinician is honing them in tight enough but a lot of times they don't and you know now I know that maybe an F wave and SSCP is is something that I need to be requesting. Tell your doctor you also need to have these done. You know, oftentimes when I write in an MRI script for something, I am telling them the pain is on this point right here. You know, I'll tell the client, tell them to tape a vitamin E tablet right over this spot and I'll put an X mark right on their hip. I said, don't wash this off for the next couple of days, you know, and, uh, you know, with a, a Sharpie marker. Um, that'll hone in the radiologist to that area or you're ordering an x-ray and you know it's the top it's the base of the second metatarsal otherwise they're just looking for frank pathology i can't tell you how many times i send someone out for hip imaging and the client forgets to hand the script over and i just get back a negative study no no hip or pelvis fracture um bone density is normal and that's it i'm like okay what what uh can I have a little bit more information here? Because, you know, I'm looking for something a little bit more specific than a random x-ray. But, you know, clients just don't know any better. You know, it's like taking your car in for me to a mechanic. I'm like, I don't know. It's a ding on the right side. I just hear it every, you know, when I'm hit at 30 miles per hour, you know, kind of important information. But, you know, but it's still kind of vague and gray to... You know, that person that doesn't on the other end. I mean, you just need to be specific. And a lot of times you're not going to get the answer because you're not dialing in the radiologist or the clinician into what your problem is. But that's why a lot of the times I like reading my own, you know, I need your disc. I want to see the imaging. And a lot of times you do exactly what we talked about. You order it again with the special parameters and the focus that you you need to help the client find what's wrong. So, Or you just look at the disc that's already been done and the problem's right there. But nobody Sometimes mentioned it because right nobody told them where to look for it. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I am always calling neuroradiologists, you know, when I'm mm-hmm. doing scans and stuff. And I'm like, oh, well, what about this? And they're like, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's there's a, pretty... There's a hundred 
the, you know, and, and they're always like, <laughs> it, it's kind of funny, but uh, at least the guys here and maybe it's different in Chicago, but they're always like, so glad you called and that somebody it's like, you looked at the MRI. It's like, of course I looked at the MRI. I look at everybody's MRI. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, I don't just read the report and not that I don't trust you, yeah. but, you know, but I'm wondering about, you know, this specific area or this slice. And, you know, sometimes I'm wrong, but sometimes, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, you're right. And it's like, you know, we had a guy the other day that came in and uh, they just mentioned like in passing in the report that he had some, you know, changes in his marrow. You know, and that, and that was about it. Well, you know, the guy comes in to see me. He's got some hip pain, lower back pain, um, and he just got a positive diagnosis because his PSA is like actually his PSA was normal, but he's got uh, prostate cancer. So I get back on the phone yeah. with the radiologist, and I got the thumbs up in front of me. I'm like, uh, this modeling, um, you know, this could be Mets, right? I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. Right. I said, well, this guy's got a positive PSA. He's like, I'll amend the report right now. I'm like, awesome, yeah. you know? It's like, yeah. but, you know, and, and that's that's the big thing I always tell people. It's just like, even if you don't know, like, just get it, look at it. And then, you know, there's enough resources on the internet. You know, you're trying to figure out a hip, just bring up a hip MRI and start reading. And, you know, go yeah. back and forth and, and see what it looks like. Um, but it's anyway. just applied anatomy. Yep, it's just applied anatomy. Thin slice anatomy. And that's all it is. That's yep. all it is. All, all right, right well, we've rambled Let's... a lot today. <laughs> yeah, we a have. Rambling kind of podcast. <laughs> Ramble on. A little Zeppelin there. There you go. All right. Well, Sean Allen here in Chicago. I have a world up deal in Colorado. We will see you next time.